Hello and welcome to the Fridays with Alice edition of the Daily Downbeat. Today's song is From the Inside, which is also off of the 1978 album called From the Inside. A great, great track. Uh, Going to dive right into those lyrics and then we'll go from there. I got lost on the road somewhere. Was it Texas or was it Canada? Drinking whiskey in the morning light. I worked the stage all night long. At first we laughed about it, my long-haired drunken friends. Proposed a toast to Jimmy's ghost. I never dreamed that I would wind up on the losing end. I'm stuck here on the inside looking out. I'm just another case. Where's my makeup? Where's my face on the inside? I'll got your kicks from what you saw up there. Eight bucks even buys a folding chair. I was downing Seagram's on another flight, and I worked that stage all night long. You were screaming for the villain up there, and I was much obliged. The old road sure screwed me good this time. It's hard to see where the vicious circle ends. I'm stuck here on the inside looking out. There's no big disgrace. Where's my makeup? Where's my face on the inside? Now, it's important to note here that Alice had dealt with alcoholism up to this point pretty severely and placed by his manager, Shep Gordon, and his wife, Cheryl Cooper, into a facility that helped him work on that alcoholism. And earlier in the week, we talked about Crazy Train from Ozzy Osbourne, and it only seemed natural to end up at this point with Alice because where he was at and what was going on in his life it's a really good narrative to kind of look into when we when we see the things we talked about, the Ozzy song, and what kind of mental toll they take on us. And then we see four aspects of our life really starting to be affected. And those four are physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And they all play a role on who we are. At this point in time, the physical aspect of it, with Alice, his body was pretty much shutting down. And the alcohol was beginning to eat his body from the inside out. And so, you know, we really see that aspect of the physical side of things. And when it comes to personal suffering and pain and all these things, it seems like we always kind of point to Job just a little bit in the Bible because of everything that he had gone through. But there's also another narrative that goes on there because pain and suffering tends to bring out another element in in us as well, where we find ourselves comforted by others that have experienced the same strife as us and you know, really, really, there's a relationship that takes place there that really should not be overlooked. And if you look in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, you really see a call for us to comfort others that are experiencing some sort of strife. And when you're walking through that narrative and walking through this this sort of uh, ailment or whatever it is that you're physically going through, you combine that with James 1, 2 through 4 and Isaiah 48, 10, And what you find out is perseverance and longevity and walking out those steps often reveals what our true character looks like. And it's really sort of a baptism by fire or cleanse by fire sort of uh, narrative going on there. And so the next element we really look at is emotional. What's interesting about emotions is we find ourselves either in one of three different scenarios normally. And it's either can we keep them controlled? Are they controlling us or do we suppress them? And so you really have to stop and think about what are you doing with your emotions? Are you expressing them properly? Do you have them in control or do they, do they control you? Or do you take those emotions and plant them in inside, allowing you to become enraged, uh, embittered or resentment start to set in and start to take place. Um, a good place to look is Hebrews 12, 2 that reads, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now stop and think about that. Jesus was joyous about the fact that he was humiliated, beaten, and, and crucified. He took joy in those things. And it's like, why? You know, what, what, what in his right mind was he thinking about this? But he knew that through that sacrifice, he was giving a gift to humanity. We have to really kind of think these things out when we're dealing with our own emotions. What is the goal? What is the ultimate end of whatever it is we're going through? And is our emotional state keeping that from happening? You know, Christ at some point had to realize that if I keep my emotions where they're at, you know, fear and any of these other things that he did express, you know, in the garden while he was praying, 
if he was to allow those to navigate and control him, he would not have ultimately carried out what it is that God placed him here on earth to do. And it's the same way for us. Christ had the same range of emotions that all of us do. He showed compassion in Matthew 9 and John 8. He showed agony in Luke 22, exhaustion in Mark 6 and Luke 5, sorrow in John 11, and many, many other emotional states that are expressed in the Word. Christ was truly human and truly God. And so there's nothing that we have gone through that he didn't go through. And when you think about the, what he still ultimately sacrificed, even dealing with all these emotions, it's something that we have to think about and know that whatever we're dealing with and whatever we're going through, we were still called to, to carry out a purpose as well. And so keep that one in mind with the emotional part of it. The mental aspect of it is is pretty wild. But when you really, really think about it, we are all in the midst of a civil war. And the civil war is taking place up here. After you've accepted Christ in your heart, that initial war has been begun. The battlefield is in your mind after you've accepted Christ. You are constantly fighting against the flesh um, and what the Spirit is wanting you to do. And so, you know, there's a lot of groundwork that's laid in like Psalms 119 that says the, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And so what you really have to think then is if I can take these words in this truth and start to recite it up here, then it can start to replace what the flesh element's telling me. If, if I'm saying, you know, um, hate, guilt, fear, jealousy, but I'm reading in the scripture, no, faith, hope, love, joy, self-control, if I start to get those two narratives going back and forth between one another and just constantly tell truth from the word at that flesh, that word is going to continually start to win and it's going to become habit and it's going to become second nature to know what's in here and to speak that and walk that out in truth. And I think one other mental aspect to look at is the world tends to think that we're brainwashed and that we are blindly walking into some sort of narrative that we don't actually agree with and don't really want, but we do it out of obligation or something. And that's just not true. We're not asked to submit our, our thought process to him in like some sort of bondage. He is actually asking us to submit our thoughts to him so that we may be free. And 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, For where he is, there is freedom. And that's a difficult thing to understand until you've embraced it. Because once you start applying these truths and start seeing a different way of life, all of these other aspects start to fall into place. And then you really want this. It's not a shackles mentality where you're being forced to walk this out or forced to do something. If you're in a church or a religious mindset that is forcing you to do something, that's not of God. That's of man. And you need to know the difference because we walk these things out in freedom and we do these things because we desire them, not because we're forced to do them. And so that's really important to take away from that mental aspect. It is a choice. There's a war being waged, and you are choosing which side you want to fight on. And the last aspect we're going to look at is spiritual. And this is where faith comes into play. It is our willingness to trust and know that there is more to this life than just the tangible things that we see. And don't get me wrong, there, there are tangible parts of your faith. There are things that can physically be seen and physically felt and physically walked out and grasped. But a majority of the spiritual narrative is unseen, and it requires faith to, to carry out. And in Ephesians 2.10, it's clearly spelling out that there is a spirit of this world who is the ruler of the kingdom of the air, our enemy, and the Holy Spirit, the spirit of salvation made available to us through Christ Jesus. And an interesting part of the spiritual aspect, um, a lot of people want to turn God or Jesus into like some sort of Santa Claus that you just get what you ask for, and when you pray, he will answer. But there's some really, really important aspects of that that show up in Matthew 7 and 1 John 5. And they really say that the power of prayer and transformation can be seen all around us, but it requires that we also seek his will. And so if the two of those things aren't lining up, if his will isn't lining up to what it is that we're asking for, 
then those things really don't take place. Um, and there's a sovereign will, according to Matthew 22, and a permissive will, according to Psalms 37. We can't expect God to move or respond if our plea requires the opposite of who he is. And that's something really that we have to think about. And for instance, if somebody walks into an abortion clinic strapped with bombs and sets those bombs off, that is completely going against who God is and what his will is. And we can walk all day long on the abortion narrative and the fact that the unborn are sacred and their lives matter, but to address one wrong with another wrong does not make a right. And that's a pretty important narrative to walk out and know that when we do things according to his spirit, we better make sure that it's actually his spirit because we are asked to bear his fruit, according to John 15 and Galatians 5. When we work together to accomplish those works, we see unconditional love that gives without asking for nothing in return. When we start walking these other narratives that are asking the wrong things of people, that's just not him. That's not working in accordance to him. And if, if we were really to boil down the whole spiritual aspect of things, I think it would, we would really have to say to ourselves, it's acknowledging that there's more. And it comes with us knowing that our righteousness doesn't come through our works but it comes through him. We are made righteous through the spirit. We are made righteous through him. And that's really what that aspect of our being is really all about, is knowing it's not about us. It's about something greater. It's about what Christ did when he stepped into our place and took on sin. And, and so I know this has been a lot. There's good, all of these scriptures are going to be listed down in the description area for you to look at and really kind of walk through and study a little bit. And if you take nothing away from today's message, know that we are complex individuals. Those four aspects of who we are, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, are all working together at the same time. And if any of those are really kind of off in any certain areas, they really kind of affect who we are. And I believe that the spiritual aspect is probably the most important because it kind of keeps all those other ones in check. And you'll notice that when that spiritual element starts to lack a certain bit, the other three start to fail maybe a little bit more on us as well. And I think Romans 1.20 is a good way to sum this all up. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, which are his eternal power and divine nature, these have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. And so what I think that really does is it spells out the fact that he is who he is, and we can't really overlook that. But let's look, let's look and see what it says here. What kind of God does nature reveal? Nature shows us a God of might, intelligence, and intricate detail, a God of order and beauty, a God who controls powerful forces. That is a general revelation. Through special revelation which is the Bible and the coming of Jesus, we learn about God's love and forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. God has graciously given us both sources that we might fully believe in him. God reveals his divine nature and personal qualities through creation. So this was a lot to digest for today. Um, Alice was going through some crazy stuff in the 70s, um, really walked out a lot of uh, who he was and who he was going to end up being. And it all kind of started in this time period. From the Inside was a autobiographical album in many ways and really kind of told the story of what it was like in that facility while he was there battling alcoholism. Uh, take some time to listen to it. Great songs on that album. But what we should really take away from this is knowing that as God's creation, we're pretty complex individuals. And there's a lot of what makes up what's going on within us. And the battles of our mind, the emotional state, um, where we're at physically, and who we are spiritually, those are all things that work together and sort of shape who we are. And if we can apply that spiritual aspect of it first, it may help us deal with those other aspects as well. So you could take that all to the bank. I hope you guys are having a great week. I hope you have an even better weekend. And as we move into this next week, I hope you keep walking in faith, rocking with Alice, and also remember to love God, love people, and love Pat. You guys have a great weekend. Take care, and we will catch you tomorrow.